Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third lecture in this practical introduction to, to quantum computing. And I would like to start again uh, saying thank you to you all. Uh, as you know, the, um, the two videos for the first two lectures are already available both on the uh, CERN document server and on YouTube. And they have several thousand views both. So, well, we are really, really happy that you are interested in the in the course. You are following the lectures, and we also want to say thank you for for all your feedback. We've received some some questions, and as always, I will address them uh, before we start with the content for today. So, uh, there were some people who let us know that uh, there were some problems with the with the video for the first lecture. I've been told that this has been already solved, uh, so sorry for the inconvenience, uh, but the problem was uh, apparently related to some browsers. So it was uh, okay on some browsers and uh, it had some problems on, on others. So if this happens again, please let us know. But also, you can try to switch uh, your browser, and maybe with a different one, it will it will it will work while we we solve the problem if it happens again. Uh, we also received some questions regarding the physical implementation of qubits. Uh, as you know, this is something that we are not covering in the course, but uh, I can point you to some uh, useful resources. So uh, in the book by uh, Janowski and, and uh, Manucci, there is a very short chapter, which is an introduction to uh, different technologies that can be used to construct, to build uh, quantum bits. And if you only want to have a, like a general knowledge of the different techniques and uh, the, the main advantages of ones and, and others, this is a, a very short, very nice introduction. If you want more details, then uh, you have whole chapters, uh, longer chapters, in both the book by Siegelman and the book by Nielsen and Chuan. They are all in the in the recommended uh, uh, books uh, list, and uh, I have also included um, a link to an online course with video lectures and some uh, additional material. Uh, in the list. So this is a, an update that I have published both in the first and second uh, lectures, uh, the pages in, in, in Indico, and also in this in this third and the page for this third lecture. So you can just take a look at the at the chapter in, in Janowski and Manucci's book, which is short, or if you want more details, you can refer to the books by Siegelman and by Nielsen and Chuan, or you can try to follow this, this course, which I think is also very interesting. Okay, so I think those are the, the most popular or the most frequent questions this week. Uh, the other ones I have tried to solve uh, by replying to the emails, uh, and I think I have uh, answered to, to uh, all the questions related to the content of the, of the course, so please free feel free to, to send um, your feedback or your questions. And of course, the people uh, which are uh, joining us in the, in the Zoom call, please feel free to ask questions at any time, okay? So I would like to start today by um, going back to the, to the notebook that we were using uh, last time, okay? Uh, I think you should be seeing it now on your screens uh, because we didn't have time to to wait for the um, for the circuit to to be run on the computer. I want to show you the results, but I I also want to show you some information that you can get um, about the devices in which you can run your your circuits. That I think um, it's very interesting and can help you decide which a uh, computer uh, is most uh, the most appropriate for your uh, experiments and uh, it can help you also uh, understand a little bit better why or how these quantum computers work okay so for instance with this uh, command here backend overview you have this nice list view of the different devices probably you will have 
some other different ones, uh, but you will have some in common with, with this list here. And the information includes the number of qubits, the number of pending jobs, whether this is uh, the least busy device at the moment or not, and two figures of merit that are uh, quite interesting and quite important. These are the times T1 and T2. And roughly speaking, you have more information in in, uh, in the books, uh, uh, in the recommended list. Uh, roughly speaking, T1 is related to the time that uh, a qubit, which is in a state one, uh, lasts in that state before decaying to, to zero. So the, the thing here is that state one is more energetic than a state zero. So eventually this state decays back to zero. Okay, so if we have a qubit which initially is in a state zero and we apply the X gate, it will go to, to state one, but eventually it will decay to, to zero, okay? So this time is related to the probability of still finding the qubit in state one, once that we have applied the, the, the X gate to a, to a qubit in state zero, okay? So this is uh, an interesting figure of merit. And of course, the higher this time, the better is the is the is the device. Okay, here we see the average value over all the qubits in the in the device, but this time is different for each qubit in in the computer. Okay, and then we have the time t two, which is related uh, to the probability of finding a qubit that we have um, set in superposition is still in that superposition. So uh, here we start with a qubit in state zero, we apply the, for instance, uh, the, the H gate, and we uh, obtain the plus state, an equal superposition of zero and one, and this time is related to the probability of um, when measuring or when doing some transformations in, uh, on this qubit, uh, that it still is in this superposition, and it doesn't decay or collapse to zero or one, okay? So again, the higher this time, the better uh, your results will be because the more quantum is the behavior of the of the qubits. Okay, so this is information that you can obtain with this command backend overview. And if you want more information about a particular device, you can use this other command backend monitor. Okay, with uh, the name of the of the device that you want to get information from. In this case, uh, I am taking the, the properties of uh, the device that is called Lorenzi. Okay, so here again, you have information, but now uh, this is a specified qubit by qubit. This, this device has five qubits, and you see here some of the information related to the, um, to the frequencies at uh, which these qubits operate. Uh, this is something that uh, it's related to the to the physical implementation, and then you have uh, information about the T1 and T2 times again, and you also have here information about the um, the errors of the different gates. Okay, so these are one qubit gates, and you see here that you have um, uh, uh, an error that uh, can occur when you apply these gates. Okay, so these are for the U2, U3 gates, which are similar to the rotations that we have been studying. Also here, you have information about the multi-qubit gates. In this case, the uh, C0 gates, the two qubits gates that we studied the, uh, last, last week. And um, you see here the error of these, of these gates, which is uh, generally one order of magnitude higher than the error for the one qubit gates, okay? So when we try to operate with uh, uh, a couple of qubits to, to entangle them, this is more difficult and the error is a bit higher, okay? So this is something that you can take into account when you are designing your circuit, you also see that the different uh, gates between the different qubits here, we have, for instance, the, the C0 between zero and one, the C0 between one and two, the different C0 gates uh, have different errors. So maybe you want to select the qubits in which you want to operate according to these errors, okay? Uh, also something that is interesting is that 
not all uh, pairs of qubits can be uh, entangled or directly or can be uh, or we can apply a, a C not gate to 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 them. Okay, so here you see that we have a C not gate between zero and one, between one and two, between one and three. But for instance, we have not C not gate between uh, zero and four. Okay, so this is something that we can also see in the information that is given here with what is called the coupling map. The coupling map gives us the connections between uh, pairs of qubits uh, in which we have the possibility of applying a C not gate. Okay, this is something that you can also check. Let me see if I can switch the, the tab. Uh, sorry. Okay, so this is something that you can also see here. If you click, for instance, on IBM Q Odense, you see this diagram, this graph in which you have the different qubits and the connections uh, between them, the, 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 the pairs of qubits in which we can apply a C not gate. We also have a color code for the for the errors of the of the gates. So the qubit is uh, uh, encircled in this um, color, which uh, when it's closer to, to purple is uh, has more error when it is closer to this green color has less error for the one qubit gates. And then the arrows between the, the, the two qubits uh, which can be connected with the C node again has this, this, um, this color code. Okay, so closer to purple, more error, closer to green, lesser. Okay, so there is a question here by R. Bianchi. Uh, about the T1 and T2 uh, times that I was explaining. So I will read it. Is it possible that states decay during a calculation? If yes, are we warned by the machine system in any way? Well, uh, the answer is that, of course, the, the states can decay, can, can lose their quantum properties during the, the computation. Uh, you see here that the times that we are um, C and for instance, for Odense are in the range of microseconds. So this is the time that these qubits uh, more or less uh, maintain their quantum properties. The time of operation of a gate is typically uh, around several uh, dozens um, nanoseconds. Okay, so you have time to uh, theoretically to apply maybe 100, 200, several hundred uh, operations, gates. But after that, you are not guaranteed to have something that is still quantum, okay? And it can happen, of course, it can happen before that. And you are not warned because there is no way of checking this. Of course, you can perform some experiments and try to see whether um, the results you obtain for circuits in which you know the answer are, um, are correct. But in a, in a given calculation, this is something that mm, you cannot know, okay? That is why we, uh, of course, need to apply uh, as much as possible error correction, error mitigation. We will talk about this in the, in the seventh lecture of the course, in the last lecture. Uh, and also, this is why we repeat the, the experiment several times, because there is no guarantee that running it once will give you the correct answer. There can be errors, the, the qubits can, can lose their coherence or can decay or, or something can happen and, and you obtain a, a, an incorrect result, okay? So I hope this answers the question. Okay, so uh, if not, please let me know. Okay, so another thing that I wanted to show you uh, are the results of the experiment. Remember that what we were doing here was running a circuit which prepared an entangled uh, state, a bell pair, okay, in which we know theoretically that uh, the correlation between the measurement of the first and the second qubit is perfect, okay. So when we run this on the simulator, we always obtain zero, zero, or one, one. It is impossible to obtain different values in, in the in the qubits, okay, when, when we measure. However, when we run this on the actual device, in Olense, for instance, in this case, maybe in your 
uh, experiment, uh, another different device was selected. But you see that there are some small probabilities of obtaining uh, results that are not what we expected, are not zero, zero, or one, one. Of course, this can happen because the actual devices, the physical computers that we are using are not perfect, are subject to these errors. Uh, this is what the T1, T2, and the errors of the gates are, are about, also the errors of the, of the measurements. So this can happen, okay? But you see here that the probability is quite low and the uh, actual results uh, fit the, the theoretical expectation uh, quite well, okay? So we, you see here that for the device in blue, we obtain almost 50%, uh, well, a little bit less than the 50% that we expected, but this is quite good, okay? So this is something that, um, that you should take into account. And when you run a, an actual experiment or a computation, this is something that you, you need to be prepared for and you need to do some kind of statistical analysis or uh, error correction, error mitigation uh, in order to, to obtain um, correct answers. Okay? Okay, so with this explained, I would like now to go back to the slides and start talking about a very interesting experiment um, that uh, uses entanglement to check whether um, reality is quantum or classical, okay? So um, I'm starting in uh, slide number 59. This is something that uh, confused some people last week. So I'm always posting, publishing all the slides from the beginning and adding new ones, okay? Just in case I need to go back for reference for some of the things that we have already covered. So please go to the to um, uh, slide number 59, okay? And this, this experiment or this protocol or this game that we are going, going to study follows from the seminal work of John Bell. I told you about John Bell, who was a scientist here, a researcher here at CERN um, last week. And um, he, in, in 1964, published a paper in which he studied um, the property of entanglement of, of, of quantum systems. And he showed that uh, if we only take into account classical explanations, what are called local hidden variable theories, then these correlations cannot be fully explained. I mean, uh, if uh, we consider an entanglement pair, there will be correlations in the measurements uh, that are higher than what we expect if uh, nature uh, follows uh, a classical uh, local hidden variable field. Okay, so this was a, a very interesting work that was not fully appreciated uh, at the beginning, but then people began to realize that it was something really, really intriguing and really, really interesting. And what we are going to, to see here is a formulation based on, on this work, which was done in 1969 by Closer, Horn, Shimoni, and Holt. This is why we call this the CHSH game, uh, in which this theorem and these inequalities that John Bell developed in his seminal paper are transformed into a kind of game that will uh, have different outcomes if we uh, have a physical theory that allows these quantum correlations and if we have a physical theory that is only classic, okay? So again, we have Alice and Bob, uh, which we know uh, already from the BB-884 uh, protocol and we will meet them again in several other different contexts. And this time they are far apart and they are participating in this game in which there is a referee uh, that sends uh, them uh, bits X and Y. So in each round of the game, Alice receives uh, a bit X, which can be zero or one, and uh, Bob receives a bit Y, which again can be zero and one. And these bits are 
chosen, and this is very important, completely at random, uniformly at random. Okay, at each round, they receive a, uh, a bid, and this is uh, completely random. The probability of obtaining zero is uh, 0 0.5, and the probability of obtaining one is uh, again 0 0.5. Okay, and when they receive these bids, uh, Alice and Bob have to reply with their own bids. They have to reply to the referee with a zero or a one. I'm going to call the uh, reply, the bid chosen by Alice A and the bid chosen by Bob B, okay? And they win the round of the game if this formula here is satisfied, okay? So this is a certain correlation or a certain relationship that has to be verified by the by the bid sent by the referee and the bids uh, chosen by Alice and Bob, which are, which is related to these inequalities developed by by John Bell. Okay, so for us the important thing here is that uh, since x and y can be either zero or one, notice that if either <coughs> sorry, if either zero x uh, is zero or y is zero, then x times y is zero. And then the XOR of the bits chosen by A and B by Alice and Bob have to be also zero. This means that when either x is zero or y is zero, Alice and Bob have to choose bits that are the same, that are equal in order to win. Okay? But if x is 1 and uh, uh, y is 1, then in order to win the round of the game, Alice and Bob have to choose bits that are different, okay? Alice can choose 0 and Bob can choose 1 and they win, or Alice can choose 1 and Bob can see, uh, choose 0 and they also win, okay? And it's also important that they are far apart so they cannot communicate. They are so far apart that uh, there is no time in the in the um, in the interval that they have to respond to reply to the referee to communicate because they are far apart and and, and communication is uh, no faster than the speed of light. And then they cannot tell each other. Well, I have received a zero. Then let's choose whatever. Uh, pair of bits uh, will make us win. Okay, so this is a, a, a decision that Alice can uh, has to take on her own. Bob can uh, has to take on her own. What they can do is to decide to agree on a strategy uh, beforehand. So before playing the game, they can agree that they are always going to answer um, zero, or they are always to answer. Uh, the same as the bid that they receive, or that they are going to flip a coin at the moment and then they are going to choose whatever the coin uh, says. If it is heads, uh, they reply with zero. If it is tails, they reply with one, or whatever any other strategy they, they can uh, conceive, but they cannot communicate during the game. Okay, so this is the setting of the, of the game. And we want to study what is the probability that they can win uh, a, a, a given round. Or if you want to see it in another way, what is the, the average number of rounds that they will win if they have a, a, the best possible uh, strategy uh, in, the classical, in the classical setting, okay? With no quantum uh, information but with this joint strategy and probably also the possibility of resorting to to probabilistic uh, bits or something like that okay so it's easy to see that well there is this simple strategy which is uh, that alice and bob always reply zero and then they win uh, 75 percent of the times three three out of four times they will win because um if either x is zero or y is zero, then a and b must be equal. And if they always respond um, with zero, of course, their bits are equal. And since the referee is choosing x and y uniformly at random, the probability of uh, choosing at least one zero, the probability of 
at least x being zero or y being zero is of course 75 percent okay and if you uh, study the, the the possible classical strategies a little bit further you realize that there is nothing better that they they can do here we can see a table with the different possible deterministic strategies classical strategies that they can follow the legend here is that well for instance for alice the reply can always be zero or can always be one or can always be the bid that uh, she receives from the referee or the opposite of the of the bid that she receives from the referee and for bob uh, the, the the choices are the same okay and here in the intersection of rows and columns you see the probability of winning with those strategies and then you can easily see that any strategy that uses uh, a combination of, of these uh, classical strategies, for instance, if you uh, resort on, on flipping coins or in, uh, and in, in changing the strategy every so many rounds or whatever, this will be a combination, a convex combination of, the, uh, of these strategies and then the, um, the probability of winning cannot be uh, higher than the best of these strategies. Okay, so it's easy to see that classically they can win at most 75% of the time. Now we change the setting a little bit and we let Alice and Bob share not only classical information beforehand, so this strategy that they, they agreed uh, upon, but also quantum information. In particular, we allow them to create uh, entangled uh, pairs of qubits, bell pairs, and to keep one part of the qubit uh, uh, for the game, uh, each of them, okay? So they create a number of entangled pairs. We know how to do this. We already know how to, how to do this with a quantum computer, and there are other physical processes that can produce these, these um, these entangled pairs, for instance, uh, what is called uh, spontaneous parametric down conversion. There are several different ways. So they create these entangled pairs. They keep part of the pair uh, for the game. Uh, Alice has one part of the pair and, and, Bell, uh, and Bob has the other part. And then they follow this uh, strategy. They uh, are going to measure the qubit but depending on the bit that they receive from the referee, they sometimes are going to apply a certain rotation. Okay, so in particular, if Alice receives a zero, she measures her qubit and outputs the result. She does not apply any, any gate, so she has her part, her part of, the, of the pair. She measures this, this part and she obtains either a zero or one, and this is uh, the qubit that she uh, sends to the referee, back to the referee. But if she receives a one, she applies this uh, rotation around the y-axis with angle pi over two. And then she measures and uh, replies to the referee with the result that she obtains. For Bob, it's similar, but if, she, if he receives a zero, then he applies this rotation with angle pi over four and uh, if he receives a one, he applies the rotation with angle uh, minus pi over four. And then he measures the qubit and sends back the, the, the result to the referee, okay? And surprisingly enough, it can be shown that then their probability of winning is exactly the cosine square of pi over eight, which is approximately 0.8. 85, which is, of course, much bigger than 0 0.75 that you can obtain with the, with the classical set, okay? This is something that you can check. This is a, an easy exercise. You can just um, write down the states that they obtain before measuring uh, for each of the four different possibilities when they receive 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and then you can check the, the, the probability of obtaining um, pairs of, uh, of bits that make them win the game. But there is an easier way uh, that I want you to, to, I want, uh, to show you 
of computing these probabilities with quirk. Okay, so let me change the, um, the screen to my browser in which I have quirk. Let me find it. Here it is. Okay, uh, where is it? Sorry. Okay. Uh, you should be seeing now quirk on my on my screen. So what we are going to do is to create first this entangled pair. Okay. Oh, sorry. This should be H. Okay. So now we have an entangled pair. You see here that uh, we have zero zero with uh, amplitude one over the square root of two, one one with amplitude. Uh, uh, one over the square root of two. So this is exactly the bell pair that we need. And now let's imagine that uh, they both receive zero from the, from the referee. Okay, so the uh, X is zero, Y is zero. So they should reply with uh, bits that are exactly equal. Okay, in this case, what is uh, Alice going to do? Alice is going to directly measure her qubit, but um, but Bob is going to apply a rotation of pi over four. Okay, so now if we check here the probabilities of obtaining um, zero, zero and one, one, which are the winning, the winning results in this case, you see that we have uh, 42.7, 42.7, which together make uh, close to this uh, 80, 85 percent that I was telling you about, which is, uh, of course, greater than 75 percent. Okay. Another situation is when uh, Alice receives a, a, a one and then she applies this rotation of pi over two. Okay. And then you see that the probabilities are again the same. Okay, in this case, um, they should reply with bits that are equal because Bob is still receiving a zero. Okay, let's see now what happens if Alice receives a zero, Bob receives a one. In this case, Bob is applying a rotation of uh, minus pi over four. And again, the probabilities of winning are uh, around 85%. And the final case is when both receive a one. And in this case, notice that Alice is applying this rotation of pi over two. Bob is applying a rotation of minus pi over four. And now they should reply with bits that are um, different. So the winning uh, possibilities are zero one or one zero. But again, the, the sum of the probabilities of 0, 1, and 1, 0 is around 85%. Okay? So this is something that it's not possible with, with classical, with classical uh, local hidden variables theories, but it's possible with quantum, with quantum uh, entanglement. Okay? I'm going to go back to the, to the slides. Okay? And this is something that uh, it's very, very interesting because it gives us a possibility of testing uh, in, in real life whether the predictions of quantum computing or I mean of quantum mechanics uh, are real and are something that is different from what we expect if we only have uh, classical correlations. Okay, and this is something that has been done it was done uh, already back in the 80s. There were some previous experiments, but they were not so convincing, uh, or there were some problems or some interpretation problems. One of the most um, famous experiments using this kind of correlation was conducted by Alan Aspect and, and his team in 1981-82. Uh, and this diagram that we have here is uh, the, diagram, the diagram of the experiment. This S here is a source of um, entangled pairs. This uh, can be done, for instance, with photons, with this uh, spontaneous parametric down conversion. And here we have A and B, which are 
polarizers that can be uh, changed. The angle of this polarization can be changed according to the different uh, angles that uh, Alice and Bob have to apply. And then we have detectors for one uh, polarization or the other. And this was conducted uh, uh, experimentally, and it agreed with the predictions of quantum theory, not with the predictions of local hidden variables. Okay. Uh, there were some doubts about uh, the methodology of these these uh, experiments and the following because uh, it could be conceived that there were some problems um, that could prevent this from being completely quantum, completely um, uh, unlike classical. In the sense that, for instance, if the uh, polarizers or the detectors were too close to each other you could uh, argue that maybe there is time for these detectors to send some kind of signal to the other so the other can change their response somehow and and make these correlations higher than they, they should be okay or also um, there was this loophole that had to be closed related to the detection efficiency of the of the of the experiment in which not all the photons were were uh, completely uh, detected and then you could argue that well those photons that you did not measure were exactly the ones that were not correlated as quantum as quantum theory predicted okay so in 2005 Hansen uh, and, and and his collaborators uh, conducted this other experiment in which these loopholes of locality and detection were uh, all solved at the same time. And again, uh, the, the results uh, were uh, in complete agreement with quantum theory. Okay. Another interesting thing is that uh, it can be proved that this probability of 85%, more or less, is the maximum that you can that you can obtain with any quantum strategy uh, if you try to uh, do something more complicated with more uh, qubits or uh, different uh, state with more uh, terms with other kind of entanglement well there is nothing that you can do which is better than this with this this is called uh, Cyrilson's bound but there are other experiments in which you can obtain 100 uh, percent correlation between between the, the results or uh, 100 percent probability of winning the game okay so this is another um, different game also based on this kind of bell inequalities which was introduced by Gringer, uh, Horn and Seilinger so this is called the GH set game and in this case we have three participants we have Alice and Bob and we also have Charlie and they receive uh, each of them a bid from a referee, but the referee now selects the bids from these strings. He cannot select any bid for any person, but he has to select at random from these from these um, four uh, string, uh, strings that, uh, as you can see, have uh, parity uh, zero. Okay, so the number of ones is always even, and they win if this. Uh, this uh, relationship holds between the bits that they respond and the bits that they have received. Again, you can prove that they can win classically, they can win only with 75% of probability. But if they share this state here, which is again an, an entangled state, uh, state, and they apply the Hadamard gate to their qubit if they receive one. Uh, they do not apply anything if they receive zero and they uh, then measure and return the answer, then they win 100% of the time. This is something that you can check. It's a, an easy exercise. You just consider the four different possibilities. You apply the edge gates or, or, or you leave them the qubits unchanged depending on what each person receives and you compute the probability. And this is something that you can easily check and they win 100% of the time. This is uh, the reason uh, why some people call this quantum pseudo-telepathy, pseudo in the sense that it seems that uh, our list, Bob and Charlie, are reading each other's minds and know what they are going to, to, to send to the referee, and then they somehow agree 
and, and they can win 100% of the time. But this is not magic, this is not uh, telepathy, this is just quantum entanglement uh, uh, at work, okay? So this may seem like, well, a nice experiment, uh, something that is really very interesting for the foundations of quantum theory, but it seems that it's not really very practical. Well, in fact, this is something that has been used and is being used um, uh, in the last few years uh, with a practical application, which is the production of randomness of, of pseudo, uh, of, uh, sorry, of uh, real random bits, which can be certified, okay? This is something that you can do because if you uh, use this, this idea of the CHSH game or the GHZ uh, game, you can um, see that if you win the game more than the 75% of the time that is uh, predicted by classical, by classical uh, theory, then there is something random happening uh, in, in, in your measurements, okay, in your, in your process. So this is something that cannot be deterministic. And if you um, apply these, these, these ideas uh, with, um, in combination with uh, the theory of randomness extraction and some other, other uh, very interesting ideas, you can use these to uh, produce uh, random bits that can be certified to be perfectly uniform, perfectly random. Okay, so this is something that, for instance, uh, uh, quantum computing companies such as Cambridge Quantum Computing uh, are doing. We are collaborating with Cambridge Quantum Computing in trying to see uh, what these, these uh, protocols and these random bits can do, for instance, for Monte Carlo simulations. And I think this is a very, very beautiful theory and uh, a very, very interesting uh, topic of research. Okay, so I don't know if there are questions about this. Okay, so then what I'm going to do is to show you how to uh, implement this, this uh, CHSH game uh, on the IBM Quantum Experience. And um, we are going to run an experiment, which I think is really very exciting, which is trying to see whether, um, sorry, uh, okay, I have it here. Whether these quantum computers that we are using at the, at the IBM quantum experience are really quantum or not, or if you want to see it in another way, whether nature is really quantum or not. So we are going to run this, this game and we are going to see what is the probability of winning that we obtain. Of course, this is not a, 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 a a serious experiment in the sense that um, we can conclude with this that uh, nature is really quantum because there are several loopholes that we are not addressing here. Of course, the qubits that we are using are close together, so there is no, no separation between them and you could argue that there is some kind of, of uh, signal uh, sent from one to the other. Uh, also, I'm not going to generate the rounds of the, um, of the game completely at random. So you could argue that maybe the, the quantum device somehow knows that I'm first running uh, only with zero, zero, then with zero, one, and then it, report, uh, it, it responds accordingly. But well, of course, this is something uh, that is not completely, completely rigorous. But I think it's very interesting because it shows that you can do physics with one of these computers or at least simulate one of these, um, of these uh, experiments uh, from your home, just sending, sending these programs to, to these quantum devices. And I think this is really something very, very, very exciting. Okay, so what we are going to do here is to create uh, circuits that are going to depend on the X and Y bits that uh, Alice and Bob received. And then here I'm also introducing these uh, parameters, which are the angles of rotation that they are going to use. Okay, so this is something that is not needed. I could just fix 
the rotations to the to the ones that we know that obtain the best possible uh, probability of winning but this is something that you can use in order to change a little bit these angles and see that you obtain uh, different results and that uh, you do not obtain something that is better than this 85% probability of winning. Okay, so what I do here first is to create the bell pair. We already know how to do this. And then for Alice, depending on whether she receives a zero or a, or a one, I apply a rotation with this angle uh, A0 or a rotation with this angle A1. Okay, so you can see here that uh, A0 is by default zero and a1 is by default uh, pi over two okay but you can change that and for for bob i do the same but with angles b0 and b1 which are set by default to pi over four and minus pi over four, okay and then we measure so what i'm doing here is defining another function that is going to run these these uh, circuits several different times in order to estimate the probability of winning. And here I'm, uh, oh, I also wanted to show you another different way of running circuits in the, in the um, IBM quantum experience that is sometimes interesting. If you have several different circuits that you want to run uh, uh, one after the other, what you can do, uh, of course, you can run one circuit, then run the other, run the other, but you can also stack all the, all the circuits together in this list. Here I'm creating circuits for bit 00, 0 01, 10, zero, and 11. One, one. And we pack uh, these four circuits uh, in the same experiment. And then we execute all the four circuits, uh, uh, one after the other, in the same job. So we do not have to wait for the for the queue uh, four times, but just one. And then we we run this for for the maximum number of shots that is uh, uh, eight thousand one hundred ninety two. Okay, so oh, I forgot to run uh, all these cells in order to obtain the result. Okay, so uh, we create this this um, this circuit. And then what I'm going to do first is to run this on my uh, uh, on the simulator. Okay, let's see if it okay it has uh, finished, so I can run it on the on the simulator. And you see here that the probability of winning that we obtain is uh, above this 85% that we were we were uh, talking about. Okay. And what I'm going to do now is to run this on the uh, on the actual quantum device. Again, I'm going to use the method that uh, I showed you last week of selecting the least busy um, uh, device. In this case, let's see what uh, it's selected. And then we will compute the probability of winning. Of course, we do not expect this to be perfectly 85% uh, whatever, but it will be hopefully higher than 75%. And this will show uh, that something random, something quantum is happening with, this, with these devices and that in fact, um, nature is, is not uh, uh, ruled by a local hidden variable theory, but by some quantum theory, okay? So this probably is going to take a little bit. Let me check how many jobs. Uh, we have only six in front of this. Okay, so I don't know if there are questions while we wait for this. Let me check the, the chat. No. Okay, so let's move to a different to a different um, protocol, a different topic. While we wait for this, we will we will go back. Okay. So I'm going back to the. Oh, it's finished. So let's let's see what is the result. So the result here is almost 80, 82 percent. 
So this is not uh, the 85% that we obtained with the simulator, but is much higher, significantly uh, higher than the 75%. Okay, so this is somehow uh, weak evidence that, that uh, we are doing something quantum here. There are these loopholes that we are not addressing, but of course, I think this is very, very exciting because it's a, a, a very cool experiment. Okay. Any question about this? Any doubt? Okay, I hope you also obtain uh, similar results uh, with, with your experiments. Okay, so let's go to the, to the slides. And let's do something that is also very, very interesting and has a, a very cool name. Okay, this is another application of, of uh, quantum entanglement, which is quantum, called quantum teleportation. Okay, so I know that there are some people here at, at CERN, at CERN Open Lab, that are hardcore Star Trek fans. Uh, so before they get very, very excited, I should say that this is not um, matter teleportation, but only information teleportation, which is something also very interesting, but we are not yet or, or, or this cannot be used to teleport people from from one of these ships to a planet and back okay but we are going to to use this quantum entanglement at least to um to teleport information okay so the situation or the problem or the or the uh, thing that we want to obtain or to achieve here is uh the possibility of Alice sending a qubit to Bob without a quantum channel. So if you remember last week when we talked about the BB884 protocol, Alice and Bob had a quantum channel and they could send qubits in different states over that channel, okay? But imagine that Alice wants to send a qubit to, to Bob and they do not have a quantum channel, okay? And the more general situation is when Alice has, has obtained this uh, qubit for, from some experiment or from, from some other source, but she doesn't know what are the amplitudes of, of her qubit. Because if she knew, for instance, that the qubit is the plus state, she can call Bob on the phone and say, uh, uh, well, my qubit is plus, you can use a Hadamard gate and create your own qubit with the same information, okay? So here we are in the general situation in which Alice has a, a, a qubit. She has no information about this qubit, but either way she wants to send it uh, to, to, to Bob, okay? This might seem impossible. There is no quantum channel. Alice does not know uh, the amplitudes or has no information on her qubit, but uh, surprisingly enough, with the help again of entanglement, we can perform this, uh, uh, this uh, sending information, sending this qubit from Alice to Bob, okay? So what is the, the protocol? I'm going to explain it uh, first and then I, we are going to see it, uh, uh, of course, in, in action. But the idea here is that we start again with um, with an entangled pair. This is something that can be prepared in, in advance uh, as in the CHSH game. Alice and Bob can have some, some uh, entangled pairs shared between them just in case they want to send qubits to each other. Or uh, another possibility is that there is a source of, uh, of uh, entangled pairs uh, that can send to a part of the of the pair to both Alice and Bob. Okay, so this is like a, 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 a source of entanglement that can on demand send uh, qubits forming an entangled pair to Alice and Bob. Okay, what does Alice Bob uh, Alice do? Alice has uh, this qubit psi with amplitudes that we do not know uh, a and b and she wants to send uh, this qubit to, to Bob. So what she does is first she applies a C0 gate to the qubit uh, that she wants to send to, to, to Bob to teleport and to her part of the bell pair, okay? So here, the first qubit 
is uh, the qubit that uh, Alice wants to send. The second qubit is the part of the bell pair that uh, Alice has. And the third qubit is the part of the bell pair, the bell pair that uh, Bob has, okay? So she applies this C0 gate. And since the, the bell pair is in this state, you can very easily verify that now the situation uh, is described by this state here. I'm working with three qubits at a time, something that we have not done before, but I think it's very easy to verify and to, to see what is happening because uh, we are applying gates to at most two qubits at a time, okay? So this is something that we know how to do. Then after applying the C0 gate, she applies the H gate. And this is again an exercise for you. You can just apply the H gate uh, to, the, to the first qubit to the uh, qubit that uh, Alice wants to send to, to Bob, and you will obtain this state here. I'm not going to, to give all the details because it's just a computation, uh, but you can check this and, and you should check this. This is the way of understanding what, what's going on. And then what is interesting is that you can factor the first two qubits to obtain the state in this form. Probably if you just apply the H gate, you obtain a, a bigger expression, but then you factor in this way. And notice that um, entangled with each possibility for the first two qubits, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, we have something that is similar to the qubit that Alice is trying to send to Bob. But it's not always exactly the same qubit. In the first case, it is uh, exactly psi, it's a0 uh, plus b1. And notice that this is what Bob has. This is what Bob has. The third qubit is uh, the, Bob, uh, the, the qubit that uh, uh, Bob has. So in the first case, uh, this is exactly what Alice wants to send to, to Bob. In the second case, it's similar, but b and a are interchanged. In the, in the third case, it's similar, but we have this um, this uh, relative phase of minus one here. And in the fourth case, we have a combination of these two cases. We have A and B swapped and also the, um, the relative phase with the B, okay? But this is something that we can uh, fix if Alice measures her two qubits, the first two qubits here in this state, making this collapse to one of these possibilities. Okay, because then she obtains when she measures either 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and she knows which of the four possibilities is the one that uh, uh, Bob has in that moment. And then what she can do is to communicate through a classical channel and send to Bob what are the results of her measurements. So. She will uh, send an email to Bob or call uh, him on the phone and say, well, I have measured my two qubits and I have obtained, for instance, zero one or one zero or zero zero or one one. With that information, notice that Bob now can reconstruct from the qubit he has and the information he has received, the uh, qubit that Alice wanted to, to send to him. Because if, Alice measures zero, zero, he does not need to make any transformation. If Alice measures zero, one, he has to apply an X gate because the X gate is going to interchange the A and B. If, Al if Alice measures uh, measure one, zero, then uh, Bob has to apply the set gate because if this set gate is going to introduce another minus here, which will cancel with the minus that we already have. And if uh, Alice measures one, one, what Bob needs to do is first to apply the X gate and then apply the set gate, okay? And this is exactly what we are doing here with this circuit. So this is the creation of the bell pair, okay? This is the, the, the qubit that Alice wants to send to Bob. This is the, uh, the, the the part of the bell pair that belongs to Alice. This is the part of the bell pair that belongs to, to Bob. So here, this is the, the bell pair being created. Now, Alice applies the C naught and the H and she measures. 
And then with this information uh, that is sent over the, com uh, the classical communication channel, Bob knows whether he has to apply the X gate or not, depending on, on, on the second qubit, uh, or the second res result that uh, Alice obtained in, in her second qubit, and whether he has to apply the set result, the set uh, gate. Okay, and with this, he reconstructs the 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 qubit that Alice wanted uh, to send to, to to him. Okay, so some comments are in order. Of course, you you need to uh, or you should in order to understand all the details do these computations. They are very easy, and they will give you a feel of what is happening there. But some some comments are in 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 order uh, to understand completely the philosophy and the implications of what we are doing here. As I've mentioned before, this is not uh, uh, matter teleportation. This is just information that we are teleporting. In fact, uh, whatever the implementation of the, of the um, qubits that we are using, photons or trapped ions or whatever, Alice and Bob will still have their own uh, photons or, or their own qubits, okay? But the information has been teleported, okay? Another thing that has, uh, that is very important to notice is that when Alice measures her qubits, in particular the qubit that she is trying to teleport to, to Bob, she loses completely this, this, uh, this qubit, okay? Now she only has the result of the measurements, because the qubits have collapsed to whatever uh, she has measured. If this were not the case, then we would be contradicting the no cloning theorem, because if Alice still had her initial qubit with this um, circuit, we would be creating copies of the same of the same qubit, and we know that this is not possible. Okay. Another thing that is interesting is that well. Uh, we cannot send um, a qubit only by giving two, uh, two classical bits. It's impossible. There is not uh, enough information in two bits to uh, specify completely a qubit. But if we also have what is sometimes called an e-bit, an entangled bit uh, that we can use for this, for this protocol, then two bits plus one entangled bit uh, is uh, sufficient, are sufficient to send one qubit. And this is sometimes expressed with this kind of inequality here. And we will see a different uh, related inequality in a few minutes, okay? So this is another way of measuring the resources that we need for some quantum communication protocols. We have qubits, we have bits, and we have uh, classical bits, and we have entangled bits. And there are several relationships between them what we can communicate uh, we, if we have some of these resources and what we need if we need to, to if we want to, to send or to communicate uh, several other of these resources to, to other people, okay? Another thing that is very important, especially since there are many, many physicists in the audience is that this teleportation is not instantaneous, okay? It may seem so because Somehow you might think that when Alice measures her qubit, that, uh, that qubit is already in the position of Bob, but notice that Bob does not know until Alice uh, sends the information of the results of her measurement, whether um, he is in this situation or in this other situation or in this other situation on this, or in this fourth situation. And the qubit is completely different. And in fact, he has to do different transformations to recover the original qubit. Imagine for instance, that the qubit that Alice wants to send is a zero, okay? Then Alice uh, measures and makes the, the system collapse to one of the possibilities. But Bob in that moment has either zero or one because uh, if he is in this situation, then A was completely one because uh, Alice had a zero at the beginning. And then Bob has a one, okay? Until Alice tells him 
that she measures zero one, she can uh, he cannot apply the correct uh, gate in order to recover the correct uh, qubit. Okay, so the uh, teleportation is not instantaneous. If Alice does not send the information about the measurements, uh, Bob has no way of recovering the, the correct uh, state for the qubit. And uh, this has to do what, uh, with what is called the no communication theorem. There is sometimes this confusion that um, entanglement can be used to instantaneously um, uh, send information, even some uh, science fiction novels and, and, and movies and series use this, or oh, we have this entanglement, then we have faster than light communication. This is not the case. It can be proved. Uh, it's not very difficult, but you need this, um, these concepts of density matrices that uh, we have talked about uh, sometimes in the past. Uh, in order to prove that whatever, whatever Alice does to his part of the qubit of the of the entangled pair is not enough for Bob to receive information. Okay, and this is called the no communication theorem. And of course, it is not violated with this teleportation protocol. Again, this is something as in the BB884 protocol or in the CHSH game that has been uh, um, uh, used in practice and has been shown experimentally that you can teleport this information. And the current record is uh, over 1,000 kilometers from uh, Alice to Bob, from the receiver to the sender. Okay, This was achieved by uh, some researchers in China with the help of, of uh, uh, satellites and they were able to teleport information from 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 qubits in the in the in the atmosphere to the ground okay and uh, i'm going to show you uh there is a question but it's a little bit long i will try to to address it uh, later okay i'm going to show you um this in the um, oh i lost my screen Sorry, I'm going to show you this in, in, in queer. You can click this, this link here to go to this, um, to this circuit in which um, I have prepared the quantum teleportation uh, protocol. Uh, you see here that, well, this H maybe might better be here to see that this is creating the bell pair. This is uh, the, the part in which uh, Alice uh, does these operations and measures, and then this is the correction that Bob has to apply. And this is the qubit that Alice is sending. I have uh, just here a rotation to make this, this qubit um, change in, in, in real time. And you see here that what Bob is receiving is exactly the same. Sorry, we are not able to see the screen, I think. Um, ah, okay. Sorry. Uh, wh why? Uh, yeah, now we can. Perfect. Thank uh, you. Yeah, but this is not this one. Sorry, sorry. I, I messed up. Uh, it's not that one. Is this one. Okay? Now you can see it? Sorry. I had two, two queer uh, windows and I selected the incorrect one. Now you can see the teleportation circuit, yes? Okay, Okay. so I will repeat. Here, this is the part in which the bell pair is prepared. This is the part in which Alice measures his, his part of the, of the qubit. And then this is the correction that Bob has to, to perform in order to obtain the same qubit that, that Alice had. So here, I have applied uh, a, a rotation in order to make this qubit uh, change, uh, evolve over time. And you see that what uh, Bob is receiving is exactly the same. If you change this rotation for uh, next rotation, for instance, of course, it will also work. OK? OK, so uh, let me go back to the slides. Okay, uh, let me 
try to read the question quickly and answer it. Okay, so uh, I will read it to you. Uh, this is a question by Matteo Paltengi. I hope I have uh, said it correctly. Uh, it's a question about the slide uh, 69. You said that there, that we are not breaking the no cloning theorem with this result. My idea is the following. With the teleportation, besides the teleporting of the qubit, we are also able to get a, me a measurement of, the of that qubit that is lost, but still we have a measurement. If we chain n blocks of teleportation circuits, uh, we can teleport uh, the qubit n times. If we do that a great en uh, enough number of times, we can get the average number of times it collapses to zero and to one without having corrupted the qubit uh, because Bob receives it. In these ways, we were able to inspect the qubit without destroying it. Is it correct? Well, this is an interesting idea, but notice that here, when we measure the first two qubits, the probability of obtaining 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 does not depend on A, on a or, or B. It's always 1, 4. So you will obtain 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 each 25% of the time, independently of B and A. Okay? So you, uh, although you do this and you obtain measurements, of course, you obtain 0, 0, 0, 1, or whatever. This is completely uncorrelated to the values of psi. Okay, so you do not obtain any information about about the the values of of the qubit that you are teleporting. Okay, so it's a it's a nice idea, and this is something that I really uh, encourage you to do to try to 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 manipulate or to change the protocols to see if you can find a a, a, a problem with them or a way of doing it in a different way uh, because this is the way in which you understand these, these, these questions. For instance, something that you can do now uh, that we have studied entanglement is to try to see what would happen in the BB884 protocol if, uh, if uh, when inter C intercepts the qubit that Alice is sending to Bob, entangles that qubit with one of her own, and then waits until Alice and Bob start sharing information about the bases uh, that were used for the, for the encoding and all that, okay? Let's see if, try to see if that gives some, some kind of uh, advantage to, 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 to if, or, and this is a, a hint about the result you should obtain, or if Alice and Bob can notice that something is going on uh, with the qubits that they are they are uh, using. Okay, so this is something that that is very very interesting, and I encourage you to do, to try to manipulate and to see different um, scenarios and different ways of of doing these protocols in order to understand what is going on, what uh, works, what doesn't work, and what are the limits of of, of these. Um, of these uh, protocols that we are uh, studying. Okay, so thank you very much for the for the questions. This is always very very interesting. Okay, okay. So uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but there are other ways of using this quantum teleportation protocol that are uh, also very interesting. For instance, this is there is this. Um, protocol that is called entangle, entanglement swapping that allows us to create entanglement uh, between qubits that have never been in contact to each other, okay? So, so far, we know that we, uh, we can create entanglement if we have something like a CNOT gate, uh, some physical operation if you take these, these uh, books and these resources that I mentioned at the beginning of the, of the lecture, you will see possibilities of, of um, implementing this physically, but imagine that you have uh, an implementation with a CNOT gate, then you can create, you can create entanglement between qubits. But 
this is something that you are applying to, to these two qubits that are uh, uh, normally close to each other. And this is a, a, a joint operation that you do on this qubit. With this uh, idea of quantum teleportation and a, a nice twist that we are going to use here, we can entangle qubits that are not closed, that have never been closed, okay? What is the idea? Well, so we have Alice, we have Bell, uh, Bob, and we have again Charlie, okay? And Alice and, and Bob share uh, uh, an entangled pair, and Alice and Charlie also share an entangled pair, okay? And what we want at the end, at the end is Bob and Charlie sharing an entangled pair, okay? But there is no uh, quantum channel between them. There is no way of, of, um, of obtaining, uh, of, of uh, sending qubits from one to the other, okay? So in this case, what we are going to do, I will explain it uh, very rapidly, is that, well, Alice and Bob, uh, well, I will explain what are the meaning of the different qubits. The first one is, uh, the first two are the qubit, uh, the, the entangled pair that uh, Alice and Bob share. So the top one belongs to Alice, the second one belongs to Bob, and then the bottom, uh, two qubits are the other entangled pair that Alice and Charlie share. So the bottom qubit also belongs to, to, um, to Alice, and this qubit above it is the one that belongs to, to, to Charlie. Okay, so you see here that Alice and Bob are sharing an entangled pair, uh, Alice and Charlie are sharing another entangled pair. And now what we do is that Alice uses the quantum teleportation protocol to send the part of the uh, entangled pair that she uh, shares with uh, Bob to Charlie, okay? So you see here that she's doing the entanglement uh, protocol between these, uh, these, um, uh, this qubit that she has, this other qubit that she has, and she sends the information to uh, Charlie so he can uh, correct her, uh, his qubit, okay? And you can check, in fact, uh, if you click here, <coughs> I will do it in a minute, you can see it in, in Quirk, that now what has happened is that Alice has sent, has effectively sent his, uh, her qubit the part of the entangled pair that uh, she was sharing with Bob to Charlie, okay? But this uh, qubit was entangled with the one that Bob had. So now this third qubit, which the, the first qubit was teleported to the third, the first one was entangled with the second, now the third and the second are entangled, okay? So this is a way of sending uh, uh, or, or, or swapping the entanglement that Alice and Charlie were sharing. And now this entanglement is shared by, um, by Charlie and Bob. Okay, let me open this and uh, let me share the screen with you. So I have many windows now here. Let's see if this, if this is this one. Okay, you should be seeing, no, I um, think this is not the one, this one, sorry. Okay, so now you should be seeing the, the screen here with Quirk. You see, this is the circuit that we were using. And I have included here a uh, 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 visualization of the amplitudes. This is the qubit uh, that Bob has. This is the qubit that, uh, Charlie has, and you can see that the joint state of these qubits is an entangled state, a bell pair, okay? And this has been uh, obtained without any communication between, Bobby, uh, between Bob and, and Charlie, okay? Another thing that you can do with this quantum teleportation protocol is also very interesting is what, call, is, what is called gate teleportation. Okay, so the idea of gate teleportation 
is to not teleport just a qubit, but teleport a qubit and apply to it uh, a certain a certain gate. Okay, so uh, the circuit is this one here, which is very easy to understand because if you see, we are applying to the third qubit a gate U, which is the one that we want to teleport. Uh, the inverse of that of that uh, gate. So in fact, these two gates cancel each other. Okay. And then we have a U here. So if you cancel this U with its inverse U dagger, you only have a difference with the teleportation uh, circuit, which is the application of this U here. So of course, what you are doing here is if you cancel this, you are teleporting psi to the third qubit and then applying U, okay? So at the end here, you have you applied to psi because up to this point, you teleported psi and then you applied the gate u. So how is this useful? Because it seems that, well, we are teleporting and then we, we are applying u. The uh, importance of this kind of protocol is that we group the operations in a certain way, okay? So instead of just preparing an entangled pair here, we prepare this pair in which, uh, uh, in addition to entangling, entangling the, um, the two qubits, we apply the U gate, okay? And sometimes this is easier uh, than just applying the U gate to a general qubit, okay? So there are situations in which you can do this in an easier way than applying you or implementing you in a general form because you only need to apply it to uh, states of this kind. So this is a particular case. And then there are situations in which applying these four uh, gates all one after the other, the different combinations that you have here because X and Z can be uh, applied or not, but sometimes applying these gates is easier than applying a general U gate, okay? So if these two conditions uh, uh, are met, if preparing this, game, this kind of a state and applying this combination of gates is easier than applying U to a general uh, uh, qubit, then this is useful, okay? Because then you can apply U to a general qubit by doing some uh, things, these two things, this preparation and this application, which are easy. This may seem a little bit convoluted, a little bit strange, but this is something that happens, for instance, when we are doing uh, what is called uh, quantum uh, fault tolerant computation. So in that context, what we are doing, we will see some uh, of these concepts in the last lecture, is uh, using several qubits to encode the information of a logical qubit and then we apply gates which are um, the analogous of the of the gates that we know okay in that situation for instance the t gate which is very important we will see that in 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 a few slides cannot be applied easily because we are working with not uh, physical qubits but logical qubits and with that error correcting codes that we need to use it is not easy to apply the, the T gate. What we can do is to create these entangled states with the application of this of, of the T gate, and then applying these gates here, it's easier than applying T. Okay, so this is something that is useful. We will see it in the context of fault tolerant quantum computing. Okay, just uh, as 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 some uh, thing, uh, some protocol in which we can apply these ideas of quantum teleportation. Okay, so finally to, to end up with these quantum teleportation ideas or quantum uh, communication ideas, I want, to I want to show you another protocol, which is somehow the inverse of the quantum teleportation protocol. In the quantum teleportation protocol, Alice and Bob shared uh, an entangled pair, and then uh, they used two bits to communicate a quantum bit, okay? And this is something that we wrote as two bits plus one entangled bit 
is worth at least uh, as much as one cube. Okay. Now what we are doing is to use uh, one cubic and one entangled bit to communicate two classical bits. So somehow this is a reverse of the protocol of quantum teleportation. This is interesting because in general, if you send just one qubit, the other person, uh, if Alice sends to Bob just one qubit, Bob can only obtain one bit of information from the qubit. This is a little mm, bit trickier than it seems to prove, but the idea is simple. simple. This is called the Holebos bound. And the idea is simple. If you receive a qubit, you can move it around, but eventually you have to measure it in order to uh, obtain information from it. And when you measure the qubit, you obtain a zero or a one, you obtain just one bit, okay? But if Alice and Bob share in advance a bell pair, then they can use the sending of just one qubit to communicate two bits, which is double the information that you can send with just one cube, okay? How to do this? Well, the protocol is very easy. The idea is that initially, as in all the other protocols that we have been studying today, Alice and Bob share a bell pair, an entangle, an entangled pair, okay? And now, after some time, this can be done in advance, after some time, Alice wants to send uh, to Bob two classical bits, uh, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, whatever, okay? And then if the second bit that she wants to send is one, she applies X, the gate X, to the part of the entangled uh, uh, state that uh, she possesses. And if the first qubit, uh, the first bit that she wants to send is one, she applies the, the set gate to her cube, okay? In that order. So uh, in the circuit, we can see this protocol. This is the creation of the entangled pair. And later, when Alice wants to send something to, to Bob, she uses this B2 and B1 to apply or not the, the X and Z gates. And then she sends her qubit to Bob. So now Bob has both parts of the entangled bit. And what, what uh, Bob does is to apply a C0 gate, apply an H gate, and then he measures his uh, qubits and what he obtains is exactly the two bits that uh, Alice wanted to, to send, okay? Let me show you this with an example. And as an exercise, you can try the other three examples. So here, what I'm going to sh uh, show you is the case in which Alice wants to send one one, uh, and what are the different states that that uh, the qubits are in the in the uh, different parts of the protocol. So we start with this entangled uh, pair with this bell state, and then Alice needs remember to apply first the X gate and then the Z gate. Okay, so what she obtains is exactly she applies this to the first qubit. Okay, so what she obtains is exactly this state here. You can check this. Okay, but now. Bob applies C0 and he obtains this uh, state here. Okay, again, this is something that you can check very easily because uh, there is only, only, only one operation that you need to, to apply here. Okay, and then notice that he has to apply an additional H gate, but this part here is the minus state. So when he applies the minus the IH gate to the minus state, he obtains one one. And when he measures, he recovers exactly what Alice wanted uh, to send to him. Okay. And the, in the other cases, it's, it's similar. You can, you can check that this works. And if you want to have a deeper intuition of what is going here, what is going on here, let me go back to uh, 
the slide in which we talked about the Bell states, okay? So what we are doing here, in fact, with this uh, super dense um, coding protocol is we start with this uh, entangled state and with the edge, with this X and Z gates, we move to one of these other two, uh, th uh, four states here. Okay, so at the end, Bob is going to have one of these uh, different uh, states, which are orthogonal to each other. Okay, so what we are doing here is to encode two bits as four different uh, states which are orthogonal to each other. And when states are orthogonal, we can use measurements to distinguish perfectly uh, among them. Okay, so when we distinguish among these uh, four states, we obtain the two bits that, that uh, Alice wanted to say. Okay, so let's, let me go back to the, to the example here and uh, to the circuit and we are going to run this we are going to run this on the ibm quantum experience so let me see if i can share the correct screen now uh it should be where okay i have too many open yeah, I think it should be this one. Yes. Let me close Quirk. Okay, and we are back in the IBM Quantum Experience. And you can find in the Indico page for the for the lecture this uh, this new um, oh we didn't run the, the CHS H um, no, so we are run, going to run both at, at the, oh yeah, did we, yes, yes, we obtained the results, yes, sorry. So we are going to run this protocol, this um, notebook for the, for the quantum teleportation of, and the super dense coding, okay? So this is something that should be quite simple to understand now, but I'm going to introduce some new um, operations that you can do in Qiskit that sometimes are useful. So what I'm going to do first is to uh, implement the quantum teleportation. And what I'm doing here is to create randomly a state for the qubit that uh, Alice wants to send to, to Bob, okay? What I'm doing is to generate um, real numbers between minus one and one, and then I normalize to obtain a correct uh, um, set of amplitudes for, for the qubit psi that uh, Alice uh, is going to send to, to, to Bob or teleport to Bob, okay? Something that we had not done before, uh, if I remember correctly, is to give names to the different sets of qubits or the different registers in our circuits. And this is something that sometimes is very useful because, well, when we have one or two qubits, it's very easy to remember uh, what each qubit is doing. But when we have many qubits, some parts of the circuit are computing something, other parts are computing a different thing. So it's useful to give uh, them names, like variable names, so to say, in order to see what is going on. Okay, so here I'm going to call psi the qubit that uh, Alice wants to teleport to Bob. I'm going to call bell the two qubits that form the entangled pair. And then we have this classical register for the measurement that I'm going to call just C, okay? And then what I'm going to do is to create with these registers, I'm going to create a, a, a quantum circuit. So this is a way that is different to create a quantum circuit to the ones that we were using before. Before we were just uh, specifying the number of quantum bits, the number of uh, classical bits. Here we are creating in advance the registers, and then we are creating uh, a circuit by joining those, those registers, okay? And this is also an interesting uh, operation that we had not seen before, which is the direct initialization of the state of a qubit 
with some values, in this case, the C1 and C2 that we have created uh, at random before, okay? Notice that this is something that you cannot do in general uh, with, the, with, with a quantum computer, okay? You cannot just choose uh, the amplitudes for your, for your uh, qubit and uh, do it like that, okay? You need to apply some gates. But here we are working with the simulator. So what happens is that uh, we access the, the values of the simulator and we set the, the amplitudes to that. In a quantum computer, this should be translated to gates that create that, that state, okay? So it, should, it, it wouldn't be like just one instruction, but probably uh, a couple of gates or whatever, uh, depending on the architecture that sets the set the uh, amplitudes to the correct values okay so in this case you see that this is the the qubit that has been created okay this is the one that we uh, are going to teleport so now what we do is with this first part we create the the, the bell pair i'm including here these um, operations which are not really operations or gates are just separations, barriers, in order to see the different parts of the circuit when we uh, draw it, okay? So this first part is the creation of the, of the entangled pair. This part here is uh, the operations that, um, that Alice needs to do, the C0, the H, and then the measurement. And these are the parts, uh, the operations that uh, Bob needs to do in order to recover the the correct uh, qubit that uh, is being teleported, okay? So if we uh, draw this here, we see the gate uh, that should be translated into several gates that creates the state that we want to teleport, then the creation of the entangled pair, then the operations by Alice, and then the operations by, uh, by Bob. This gate here may seem strange, but this is the way in which sometimes the control set is represented, okay? So here is a set uh, controlled by the first cube, okay? And I'm going to run this on the state vector simulator. And well, in this case, I don't know what is going to be the result of this. So um, I'm going to use the whole state of the three qubits and for some values of the first uh, two qubits, we will obtain for either 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, the correct amplitudes in the, in the rest of the state, okay? So here you see that we had 0 0.0998, it's exactly what we have here, uh, 0 0.794, well, the same here up to, up to rounding, and also for the second part of the, of the of the uh, state, okay? So this, you can repeat several times and you will always obtain the, the correct answer. Uh, regarding super dense coding, this is also very easy. I'm going to create just one register, which I call Bell, then a classical register for uh, measuring the, um, uh, the, the, the results uh, uh, at the end for, for both. And then I'm going to first uh, bell pair, okay? This is the initial part, the, the sharing of the entangled pair. Then I'm going to generate for, for this um, two bits uh, that she wants to send. And depending on those bits, uh, Alice is going to apply the gates X and Z. In this case, she's sending one one, so she has to apply both both uh, gates. Now, this qubit is sent to to Bob that uh, now possesses both parts of the entangled pair. He can apply the C naught, the edge, uh, and then measure uh, the the result. And if we execute this uh, this circuit, of course. Bob receives one. Okay, you can repeat this several times and you will obtain always the correct result. Okay, let me go back to my slides.
Okay, any question up to this point? Any comment? Okay, so we have time to cover one last section, uh, which is exactly this time what I was aiming for. Okay, so we are on time, uh, which is a little bit different. Okay, so just to, to recap a little, up to this point, we have studied mainly uh, quantum communication protocols. We have studied uh, PB884, which can be used for quantum cryptography. We have studied today uh, quantum teleportation, quantum uh, super dense coding, also the CHSH game. But none of these um, protocols can be considered properly computations in the sense of having some initial data, some input, doing some operation and obtaining a result, okay? We are sending information, we are um, uh, being able to, to, to share a key for uh, then using it in a, in a proto uh, protocol of uh, classical cryptography or whatever, but we are not doing computation. We are not really running algorithms with input data and obtaining uh, output data. Okay, this is something that we are going to start to do now until the end of the course. Uh, and for that, we need to introduce a new element. Up to this point, we were using superposition and the uncertainty principle, for instance, for the security of the BB8, uh, uh, BB84 protocol. So we use superposition a lot there. Then we used entanglement. Oh, today was all about entanglement the CHSH game and these two protocols were uh, exploiting entanglement to, to, to do some uh, interesting uh, communication tasks. But there is a third uh, ingredient that we need in order to exploit the, the full uh, capacities of quantum computers for quantum computation, for quantum algorithms. And this is interference. So, so far we know about um, superposition about entanglement. Now we are going to use interference to do some computations, some uh, to, to execute some algorithms in a faster or uh, better way than with quantum, uh, with classical computers, okay? So we are going to study today the first uh, ever quantum algorithm, which is called Deutsch algorithm which was proposed by uh, David Deutsch in 1985. This is a, a little bit a strange problem that we are going to solve. This is not practical in, in any sense, but was the first hint that quantum computing, quantum computers could do things in a faster way than classical computers, okay? So you will see that this problem is really not practical. Uh, but it's, it's something that quantum computers can do in a faster way than, than classical computers. And uh, next week, we are going to extend this uh, with what is called the deutsch jotz algorithm, which is a generalization of this problem, to a situation with, uh, with a lot of qubits. Here, we are going to work with only two qubits, but then we are going to work with a lot of qubits, okay? And the the statement of the problem is a little bit strange, as I was uh, telling you. So the idea here is that we are given a, 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 a Boolean function, a one-bit Boolean function, which is implemented with a quantum circuit, okay? We have already talked about uh, the possibility, and we will uh, revisit this topic again next week, about the possibility of implementing classical operations with quantum computers. This is something that we can always do. Uh, so we are given here a quantum circuit that implements um, a, Boolean, a Boolean function, okay? And since this is a Boolean function with one input and one output, it can only be one of four possibilities. It is either always zero for all, for all inputs, always one for all inputs. It's either the identity, it returns zero when uh, the input is zero, one when the input is, is one, or it's the negation. It returns one when the input is zero and zero when the input is one. 
these are the four the four possibilities okay so we are given one of these in a quantum circuit but this is a black box this is a circuit that we can use but we do not know what gates are inside the circuit okay we can plug this circuit in our um in our uh, quantum computer and use it together with other gates but imagine that we cannot see inside this is something similar to what could happen if you are doing classical programming and you receive some function which is already compiled and you can call it you can use it but unless you you reverse engineer what is inside the function you don't know what is doing okay so this is something that you can call you can put uh, as many call it as many times as as you wish with as many inputs as you wish but you cannot see, not, not see what is inside it okay and the problem that we are asked to solve is to determine whether the function that we have been given is either constant or balanced so constant is if it always returns the same value for all the the possible inputs always zero always one yeah and balance is if it returns half of the time zero half of the times one okay so obviously this covers all the four different cases uh, for functions boolean functions of one okay and in the classical setting if we are given a black box implementing this function we are allowed to use it and we need to determine whether it is constant or, or, or balanced, it is clear that we need to call the function two times. Okay, we need to call the function with zero and we need to call the function with one and see the answers and see if they agree or disagree. If they agree, then the function is constant. If they disagree, the function is balanced. And there is no way around this because if we just evaluate the function on one value, say in one and it returns zero we have no information about whether it is constant or not because for the other input for zero it can be the same or it can be different okay amazingly enough in the case of quantum uh, computing we can solve this problem with just one call to this oracle with just one evaluation of the function but we need to do this in superposition, okay? And we are going to use the superposition at the beginning, then the entanglement, and at the end, interference, okay? First, in order to understand the algorithm, we need to explore a little bit more this concept of an oracle and how we can use it in our quantum circuit. So remember that all the operations in, in a quantum computer, uh, step, uh, except in the, the measurement, are reversible. Okay, so all gates are reversible. So this black box that we are given uh, must also be reversible. Okay, so the way in which we can access the values of this function f and at the same time keeping the reversibility of the operation is by using this oracle which has one input x which is the value on which we want to evaluate the function okay and this is not going to change when we use the oracle for the function and then another uh, quantum bit which is used to obtain or to recover the value of the of the of the function on x okay and in order to make this reversible notice that i'm using here uh, the xor operation because if i apply again this oracle uh, after this first application i will have y uh, xor fx xor fx and the two fx will cancel and i will return to xy okay so this is reversible because in fact it is its own inverse okay so we have this way of implementing uh, the action of a boolean function in this reversible way and this is something that can be done with any boolean function just by using um, the gates that we have been uh, studying okay we will talk a little bit more about this when we have 
uh, oracles for, for, for uh, a bigger number of kids, okay? So we are given this oracle that acts on this way and always gives us this uh, evaluation of uh, f on the input x. If we set y to zero, then we have here the result of, of f on x and we can uh, use that in our uh, subsequent computation, okay? We are given this oracle. How do we use this oracle? just one time in order to answer the question that, that uh, is posed in Deutsch problem. Well, the idea is to use this very simple um, circuit here in which notice that we are starting with uh, qubits uh, zero and one, okay? So this is different to what we usually do, but this is something that is not, um, difficult because we can start with zero and then apply an X. This is something that is uh, easily done. So I can uh, just put one here and, and, and notice that this is not different from, from uh, the general situation. Then we apply this H Hadamard gates, then the Oracle, and then another Hadamard gate and a measurement. Okay, I will explain the behavior of this circuit in a minute with all the states. But notice that this is extremely simple. These are, in fact, very simple gates, the X gate, the H gate, and then this measurement, and of course, the oracle that we are given, okay? And uh, surprisingly enough, this circuit gives us the correct answer to the problem of whether F is constant or is balanced. When we observe the result of this measurement, if we obtain zero, then the function uh, implemented by the oracle is constant. And if we obtain one, this means that the uh, function uh, implemented by the oracle is balanced, okay? But notice that I have used only once the, the oracle, I have called to this oracle only once. And this is something that in the classical setting we cannot do with just one call. It is impossible to obtain this global information about the, about the, uh, the, the function because this is in fact information about the whole operation of the, of the function. And with just one call in the classical case, we only obtain information about what happens with one of them, okay? Why does this work? Okay, so I'm going to show you here the, the computation. Again, this is something that I encourage you to try on your own, to follow all the steps. This is something that uh, at the beginning seems a little bit strange, seems a little bit like magic, because we are doing here some computations that are not easy to understand intuitively. It's not something that is uh, similar to a classical algorithm in any way. But we will see that at the end, it gives the correct answer, okay? So it's interesting to, to check all the steps and try to see what is happening here. At the end, I'm going to give you uh, some intuition of why is what is happening here in, uh, with a physical analogy, okay? But uh, I encourage you to try and, and check all these, these computations and try to feel why this is working. Okay, so here is the circuit. Remember that we uh, start with the initial state zero one, and then we apply these gates H uh, to each of the qubits, okay? So these are applied uh, independently. In fact, this is a tensor product of the gates. So we apply H to zero, H to one. If we apply H to zero, we obtain the plus state. If we apply H to one, we, we obtain the minus state, okay? And we can write this in this other different uh, way, okay? If uh, we just multiply here, we obtain this other different expression for the same state. Now we apply the oracle, but remember what was the operation of the oracle? The operation of the oracle was just adding F of the first qubit to the second qubit, okay? So, by linearity, we can operate first on this uh, part of the state, then on this part of the state, and just add both parts after the operation, okay? 
if we apply here again uh, linearity we can operate first with zero zero and then with zero one and then we have to subtract these these two results okay so if we apply to zero zero what is going to happen is that the oracle is going to add the f of the first value to the second uh, qubit okay in this case the second qubit was one so it's going to add the f of the first qubit, which is zero to the second one. And for the second part is the same, but now the first qubit is one, okay? So you would agree with me that this is the state after we have applied uh, this oracle here. But we want to manipulate this state a little bit more in order to obtain something uh, that is easier to, to, to work with before we apply the Hadamard, the final Hadamard gate, and then the measurement, okay? So notice that if the Boolean function on zero returns zero, then this F zero is zero, it's nothing. So we have exactly what we had at the beginning, zero minus one. However, if F of zero is one, then this is one, this is one, zero plus one is one, one plus one is zero, and we obtain one minus zero, which is of course minus zero minus one, okay? And you can say, well, but that is exactly the same state because you told us several different times that a global phase does not affect um, the, the state of the, of the qubit, okay? But notice that in this case, we have two different parts, two different parts. And the same can happen, the same that happens for F0 happens for F1. So in the first part, we are applying F0. In the second part, we are applying F1. And we can have a difference in phase in the two parts. We can have not a global phase, but a relative phase, okay? So in fact, I can write this uh, this uh, operation here as minus one to the power f of zero, because if f of zero is zero, this is one. And if f of zero is one, this is minus one, okay? And this is a way of writing both possibilities with just one uh, term, okay? And the same is uh, true for f of one. We can write the second part as minus one to the power f of one times one times uh, the state zero minus one. Okay, so these just are just algebraic manipulations. Let's do one additional manipulation. The additional manipulation is to multiply all the state, all the state, and now this is indeed a global phase because I'm multiplying all the state by minus one to f. Uh, to the power F zero, okay? And if I multiply all the state, not just part, but all the state by this global phase, what I obtain is exactly the same, okay? But if I multiply the state uh, by minus one to the power F zero, these powers here cancel because then I have minus one to uh, two uh, times F zero, which is always one. And here I have minus one F zero, plus F1. And here you can begin to see that now we have some information about the global behavior of the, of the function, okay? This is something that we wanted in order to know whether the function was constant or balanced. And in fact, if both uh, values are the same, then this is the case in which a function is constant. What we have here is again one. So we will have zero plus one times zero minus one, okay? So it's important to notice that here I have zero plus one. However, if F zero and F one are different, one of them is zero and the other one is one. So the, their addition is one and this is minus one. So instead of zero plus one, in the first qubit, I'm going to have zero minus one, okay? But now the final step is to apply the H gate, 
And when we apply the H gate to zero plus one, we obtain zero. And when we apply the H gate to zero minus one, we obtain one. And that is exactly what we measure at the end of the series. So if the function is constant, we are going to measure zero. If the function is balanced, if the function is not constant, we are to going to measure one, okay? And we have done this, we have solved this problem with only one evaluation of the function f, okay? So this is, as I told you, a little bit like magic because we have done some strange manipulations of symbols here and at the end we obtain the result with only one call. How to try to interpret this in a more intuitive way, okay? So notice that the, the, the whole uh, role of this second qubit is what we have here to introduce this, this relative phase, okay, which can be one or minus one, okay? But it's never, never transformed. So in fact, what we are doing is uh, an operation which either adds a phase of zero, uh, of uh, one to the first qubit or a phase of minus one to the first qubit. This is similar to physical experiments quantum physical, uh, in, quantum in quantum mechanics, like the double slit experiment or the one that I'm showing you here, which is called the Maxander interferometer, which the physicists uh, in the audience surely will know, in which we have uh, an arrangement uh, with photons. We have a beam splitter that uh, divides the, 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 the photons, somehow the, the photons that arrive, uh, half of them in one direction, half of them in one direction, but really what is happening is that we have a superposition of both paths. So this acts exactly or similarly to the H gate that we are using. And then in one of the paths, we add a phase. We add some, um, uh, some, some uh, device that changes the phase of the photons that go through that direction. And then when we recombine the, the, the paths of the, of the light, again with a beam splitter, or uh, in our case, with something similar to HK, we obtain the uh, probability of measuring in this direction and in that, in that direction, which is uh, depending on the angle that, uh, of the phase that we have introduced, okay? So this is exactly what is happening with the, um, with the Deutsch Jotsa problem. Sometimes we are adding in both paths the same phase when the function is constant. Sometimes we are adding a minus phase in one path and no phase in the other. And this causes the interference at the end. And this causes that we measure different uh, values depending on whether the function is constant or not, okay? So this is all that I wanted to tell you. Thank you uh, for today. Um, oh, somebody's telling me, telling me that I missed an H in Max Ender. I will correct it, sorry. Uh, so thank you very much for, for your attention. Uh, I will be happy to answer questions by email uh, and uh, I hope to see you again next week. Thank you so much.